Hello everybody and welcome to my session on inclusive design, reality and practice. Uh, my name is Kate Sheehan and I am a director of the OT service. Just to give you a little bit more information about myself, I'm an occupational therapist with 33 years of experience, starting initially working in the NHS and the social care sector before moving to the independent sector about 25 years ago. Um, our company and me in particular work with case managers, solicitors, uh, individuals, manufacturers and retailers, uh, professional bodies and housing providers and many, many more. Um, what we do as directors is we continue to do clinical work ourselves because we feel that we're only able to provide the best service with ourselves and our associates if we're still doing clinical work. It keeps us kind of based in reality, which is a lot about what this session is about. So let's look at the learning outcomes. What I want to do today is describe how the physical and mental health of a client can be influenced by their environment, um, to be able to explain the inclusive design principles and to illustrate how these principles can influence housing design and specification for our individual clients. So let's look at our home. Houses are more than bricks and mortar and pr that provide shelter for us. They are our homes where we bring up families, socialize with friends, our own space where we can unwind, keep our possessions safe and take refuge from the rest of the world. Having a home that is safe and free from physical hazards and barriers is essential for our physical and mental well-being. And I think over the last a um, few months during uh, the pandemic, home has become more important to more people as it's influenced what they've been able to do and what they've not been able to do. And, and I'll give you an example later on. But I think we need to very much think of not houses, but homes, because, because homes make them personal to an individual. And that's what we're working with individuals. So how does a home have an impact on somebody's physical health? Well, the World Health Organization, I think, put it very succinctly, and they said, people with functional impairments living in accessible home environments have better health and are better able to accomplish everyday tasks and manage independent living than those people who are living in conventional or inaccessible home environments. I just want to give you, you an example. If you have a client who's been discharged home in this COVID period and those kind of um, more major adaptations or alterations or new home hasn't been found, but you've had to move somebody out of hospital because of the increased risk of infections, people have been going back home to environments that restrict their ability to carry out activities of daily living. Um, and to give you an example, people who, um, a client who had a stroke, who had gone home and was living in their living room, yes, they were home, but they could only access their living room. Uh, they had a commode in there, they were washed in there, they ate in there, they socialized in there. And uh, talking to that person, they said, can you imagine what it feels like to have to do everything in one room? But he said, just, just the fact that he has to defecate in the same room that he has to eat had a massive impact on his physical health. Because he said to me what he did was he tried to hold his feces in because he didn't want to go in his bedroom and his living room. Um, and he on two occasions ended up impacted and that affected his physical health um, and made things actually even worse. So it had a massive effect on his physical health and well-being. But it can also have a massive effect on people's mental health. And in fact, I think it has more effect on mental health and physical health because often society will look at physical barriers as a priority over uh, mental health um, kind of impairments or things that can affect our mental health. And the Equalities and Human Rights Commission last year produced a housing and uh, a report on housing disabled people. 
and again stated very succinctly that inaccessible housing leads to dependence on others resulting in depression they're not being able to do things independently yourself it increased anxiety and stress because um, you're constantly struggling in, in a property that doesn't meet your needs so everything is a challenge so everything becomes stressful it leads to social isolation because people who perhaps cannot wash don't feel clean enough to go out and socialize or it could just be the physical fact that you've got stairs to the front of your property and you can't physically get out easily and therefore can't be impulsive and meet a friend at a coffee shop. But it also then reduces your social networks because people feel that you don't want to socialise with them. So those relationships kind of dwindle and fall off. Um, but it also produces that lack of dignity. But I also want to talk here about sensory needs as well, in the fact that if you don't have an accessible property, it can have a massive effect, especially on children. And again, to give you an example of particularly during this pandemic, um, I had a family who had um, a child who had sensory needs and had um, attention deficit disorder and the way they managed it as a family living in a third floor flat was they used to take him out at least twice a day and they would go to the park and they would run, they would exercise, they'd go on the swing, they'd go on the slide, they'd go on anything round and round and round. Um, they would whirl him round um, with themselves and suddenly in lockdown when they're only allowed to go out once, um, they found that that affected his mental health and he became more and more agitated and distressed about being indoors and therefore his mental health deteriorated resulting in the family's mental health deteriorating now if he'd have been in a property with a garden yes it wouldn't have been quite the same as a park but they could have adapted uh, they could have done different things in the garden but they didn't have access to that and that inaccessibility caused massive effects on the mental health of the whole of the family. So our homes and our communities are critical for our physical and mental well-being. I don't think anybody would suggest otherwise and the, the, the kind of clinical evidence that out there is not just based around today but we can just go back to the Victorian times when we look at the slums and the fact that that had massive impacts on people's physical and well-being. It's nothing new, the evidence is clear. But let's look at the inclusive design principles because inclusive design aims to promote, uh, it aims to remove the barriers that create exclusion. It enables everyone to be a partic to participate equally, confidently and independently in everyday activities. And the key to the design, um, to design places that can be used by everybody, um, regardless of ability or impairment. And the inclusive design principles were published by the Commission of Architect and the Built Environment, quickly known as CABE, uh, and they have five principles and then some underlying uh, principles under that. Um, and they not only relate to a person's home, but they relate to the whole community. And their aim was to try and get designers, both of residential and um, uh, public buildings to design things that everybody can use. And the five principles they came up with were as follows. Inclusive designed places put people at the heart of the process. I don't think any occupational therapist who sat out there would disagree with that. We would always put people or our client at the centre of any design process. Um, it's in our code of ethics. It's in our uh, standards of practice and proficiency for the HCPC. So we do already, in reality, put people at the heart of our design process. Inclusive um, design acknowledges diversity and difference. 
And again, with the people uh, and the clients that we're working with, we are constantly looking at the differences and the diversity that come with that person and how we can meet their needs within their home environment. Inclusive design offers choice where a single design solution cannot accommodate all users. I would say generally it's very rare that our clients are living alone. Um, they might be living alone but they might have care coming in and certainly people who live alone don't not have family or friends visit. So we need to look at designing to accommodate all the users of that home environment space. ID provides for flexibility of use. So again, for me uh, as a housing OT, it's, you know, we're not looking at a client as a snapshot in time because that person will change as they age and we need to try and meet their needs long term into the future. I'm not saying that I have a crystal ball and I can see what it is, but there are some things that you can take into account that might happen in the future. ID provides buildings and environments that are convenient, enjoyable to use. And actually, if we're not providing a home environment that's enjoyable to use, I think we've gone wrong somewhere. It has to be somewhere that the client feels safe, secure, and enables them to do those activities of daily living that they choose to do, or those hobbies that they want to do within their home. So let's break that down a little bit further, because underneath all of this, these five principles, Cabe talks about um, the environment in particular, and they say the environment has to be inclusive, responsive, flexible, convenient, accommodating, welcoming, and realistic. So those are the kind of key features. So can we use these principles and key features when we design for our client? It's hmm, a question. And this made me think because sometimes it's good to sit back and think about your own practice and reflect on what you do. And, you know, even after 33 years, boy, do I learn every single day. Um, but when we look at somebody who's had a catastrophic injury or a catastrophic change in their life, it doesn't happen to one person. It doesn't happen to the client in isolation it has an impact on lots of people. And that ripple effect on people around that person at the center can go out quite wide. And when I was thinking about this and design the inclusive design principles, this is where inclusive design principles enable us to think a little bit more deeply about somebody's home environment. Because the client is at the center of the process, but they're not there in isolation. Often if it's a child, there's parents. Again, if it's a child with siblings, and even if a person is older, they still have parents, they still have siblings, and we need to think about them. There's also the extended family and what that means to that person, whether we need to take them into account. There could be a partner not living with them, but could be living with them. We have friends who are going to be supporting them. But there's also the other things that influence the design uh, and influence the way going forward. There might be the case manager, the therapist, the carers, and also the one thing that often gets forgotten in this is pets. Especially if somebody prior to a catastrophic injury had pets, are we designing to meet the needs of those pets as well? Um, because that's just as important. So this is what we need to look at when we're looking at inclusive design. So going back to those key issues, we did talk about an environment being inclusive, responsive, flexible, convenient, accommodating, welcoming and realistic. And I did ask the question, so can we use these principles in reality when designing for our, our clients? Of course we can. Let's look at them individually. Inclusive. What they mean by inclusive is everyone can use it safely, easily and with dignity. And again, this is something about when we're designing a home. Can it be used by that individual? So I'm just going to take an example of kitchens. Um, kitchens are often not thought about that much. 
uh, unless you've got somebody who's specifically the domestic person who's going to be doing the cooking as a client. But most of us at some point in our life have to go into a kitchen, even if we have a partner or somebody else who takes responsibility for it. But we need to look at the kitchen and how it works with an individual. Um, and I wanted just to bring up my client here who's using uh, the induction hob. This was a lady who was involved with for a number of years and had a catastrophic injury abroad uh, and came home and we designed a kitchen that enabled her to cook. She wanted a fixed surface uh, for cooking because she felt it better met her needs and she didn't want to be moving things up and down. Um, especially as she had a, a young three-year-old daughter and she was just worried she'd go underneath it, even though all the safety precautions are there. Um, so we put in a fixed unit, um, but she also had a partner who came in and out of her life, um, but liked to cook as well. So we did half the kitchen at a fixed height, lower level, and half the kitchen at a higher level for him, which included a separate hop. Um, but also in this kitchen, what was really important was looking at the extended family, because this lady, yes, she wanted to cook, but she also had a daughter who she wanted to engage in cooking and teach to cook, but also to be part of it and for the, the food preparation and the cake making would be fun. So we had a high level, we had a low level, and then we had a height adjustable um, table, which was fixed most of the times, but allowed it to go up and down when mum wanted to do specific activities. Um, and I remember turning up one day um, at her home. It was actually an agree visit, um, but I hadn't realised it was the daughter's birthday party. And the joy of seeing mum doing biscuits um, decorating around this adjustable table with very hyperactive at that time four-year-olds I have to say it was really joyful um, and it really meant that that environment was inclusive it was easy to use for everybody and it provided dignity and occupation and purpose and joy and was welcoming and that's what we really need to be doing when we're, we're designing a home for somebody it has to be inclusive for everyone it has to be responsive and i think if i was putting these in the um in a list myself i would probably put this one first because actually what they mean by responsive is taking account of what people say they need and what they want. Um, and again, when you're working with designing a property for somebody, you've really got to listen. What do they want to do? What are their goals? Because maybe my goal as a therapist will be different from a client's goal as an individual. Um, and you know they might have a, f a future in their mind which I cannot see unless I talk to them and I actually listen. And I often say we need to listen but also write a list so we can say, repeat back to the client, this is what you're telling me you want, have I got it right? We need to reaffirm that, but we also need to continually reaffirm that through the design process and even into the build process to make sure that we're not missing anything out. Now this is ide the ideal way of doing things. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. And as a housing OT, you're constantly juggling um, that kind of needs and wants of an individual um, because things change um, and you have to explain to builders why you're wanting to do things in a certain way. You have to explain to architects and surveyors as well about the person in the project, not just the bricks and mortar. So really, we've got to listen to our clients and what they want and what they need. And just coming back to this word want, everybody gets a little bit scared about want. Uh, but actually, sometimes when you start discussing what may be seen as a want, suddenly becomes a need. And it's being able to clinically justify what somebody wants and whether it's really important. Um, and also be able to explain back to a client so you're saying that you want this have you thought about x y and z um, my classic one is people going oh i want a swimming pool um, and i can understand that i really can understand that 
but sometimes you just have to explain is this the right thing is this the right way of getting that hydrotherapy or that exercise can we do it in a different way um, it's a huge expense which is fine but it's an ongoing expense how often are you going to use it um, will it become this kind of white elephant that is not used um, and often use the example of gym membership you know we all have that great um, positive feeling that on January the 1st we're going to be going to the gym and use it, using their swimming pool three times a week and by the end of January if we're getting there once a week we're lucky and it dwindles off and I'm just saying try and think about it long term and if you are really going to be using it three times a week then maybe it's worth looking at that want becoming a need but let's think about other ways of meeting those needs that might allow you to do other things in your property with the space that you've got available. But it's about talking and being responsive to the, the client and what they want. So flexible, different people can use it in different ways. But I also look at the client being able to use it in different ways themselves. Um, so a great example of this is we might have somebody who ha is ambulant but has chronic fatigue and at times might use a wheelchair. You might have somebody who has had um, a brain injury with some physical impairments who, again, that fatigue is quite extensive and in the morning they might be able to do more than they can do in the evening. And we need to take that into account when we're designing. So um, this is a classic example of a height adjustable sink. Uh, there's lots out there, this is just one, and there's some really nice ones coming out now. Um, but it allows somebody to stand and do their morning uh, personal care routine. Uh, and during the day, it might allow them to lower it slightly so they can perch. Or in the evening, it might be able to go lower and allow them to um, use it while using a wheelchair. I think the other thing here is thinking a little bit away from the client. So thinking about that client I've just spoken about, her three-year-old daughter, she was really keen to be mum. She didn't want a nanny. She didn't want care coming in. She wanted to do as much as she possibly could with her daughter. And she had height adjustable sinks, not only in her own suite, but in the family bathroom, because she was able to lower it to her daughter's height. And her daughter was able to learn quite early on independent living activities that probably wouldn't have come until later. Um, but she was teaching her daughter that independence because it meant they didn't need to have to have anybody in the house to assist. So it's about people being able to use products in different ways or uh, uh, being able to get into a building in different ways. So from a kind of more public building use, um, the inclusive design principles will say you should have automatic opening doors in public buildings because that allows everybody to get in regardless of ability. The only thing that they say with that is you need to take in sight impairment and look at how you can make sure people know that the doors are opening. Um, but that's a way of a flexible use of a product which meets everybody's needs regardless of ability, age, gender, um, and that's what they are hoping to achieve. So also let's look at convenience. Everybody can use it without too much effort or separation. Um, and, and this really does make me think. Uh, and it's the one thing that challenges me, I think, most of the time when we're designing is that um, we design sometimes with the space for the client being almost an appendage to the main home. Um, and, and often with children, you'll go, oh, well, they've got their ground floor bedroom and bathroom and carer space and therapy space. And then we've got the family space here. And actually, that is causing separation. Now, in some times when care is quite invasive into a family space, I can understand it. Um, but if you are having an environment that kind of excludes a person with a disability from the family space, I think we just need to take a step back and go, who are we being convenient for? Um, 
because if a person needs to use the lavatory in the family space and they have to go quite a long distance to the bathroom in their own space, should we be designing at least a bathroom downstairs or in the main family area that is usable? It's maybe a discussion to have. I'm not saying it should or it shouldn't, but I do think we need to look at inclusion, not exclusion. And you know, if we're putting in a closet mat because somebody can't physically wash and dry themselves, um, and but they, if they have to do it, they have to go into their own space to do it. I'm questioning whether that is convenient for the client. Um, and also, you know, with closet mat or gabbret or any of these toilets, you can use them as a conventional toilet. So it's not as if it's impacting on other people who use that home environment. Accommodating. So the space accommodates all people, regardless of their age, their gender, their mobility, and their ethnicity, or their circumstances. And what really came to mind here with the mobility, again, is about when we're designing homes for people, are we actually designing them for our clients? And are we taking into account their whole needs? Um, so sometimes, again, it's when you're designing, I just mentioned, a kind of ground floor um, uh, facility for somebody with a disability, but you're in a two-store property. And that client cannot get upstairs. So you're not putting a lift to get in upstairs. And I find this quite challenging personally. So if you've got a child who is living on the ground floor and she has siblings who are upstairs, that child on the ground floor can never make that decision to go upstairs and play with her siblings because she can't get there. If you've got more than one sibling and those two siblings are upstairs playing away and you can hear laughter and fun and giggles, how does that make you feel as that client with a disability where, is you, where you can't get upstairs? Now, perhaps mum and dad are upstairs and you know, you're in your teens, but you can't go upstairs to get mum or to get dad. You can't have that moment, even in teenage life, where you just want to hug, but you don't want to have to go, mum, can you come here? Maybe you just want to go and find your parents or your siblings or whoever, or your partner, whoever is living in that house. So we need to think of the impact of a two-story property and not being able to get to the um, first floor. And I know lifts are expensive, and I know there's an ongoing cost, but let's think about, is that environment really accommodating the needs of that individual client and their family? An environment needs to be welcoming. Um, and what they mean by that is not disabling barriers that might exclude some people. Now, I use this image um, because it was just showing the different levels of a garden. And I know there's sloped access at the back, um, but it's can the person that you're designing for actually get to the area that they want to play in or the area where there's going to be a barbecue? Um, and again, it almost, comes back to that stairs again, doesn't it? And can you get upstairs? If you're designing a home for a client, they really should be able to access all areas unless there's somewhere that's dangerous or there is no way that we can do the adaptation safely because it's an existing property. But there has to be ways of doing things. And sometimes we just have to think a little bit outside the box. Uh, and I just want to um, look at something like this. This is a sesame lift, which actually looks just like normal stairs, but can be installed externally um, to provide access to different levels. Now, I know it's phenomenally expensive. Um, but if it's what's going to get the client to be welcomed into their whole home environment, surely we should be putting this forward as an option for our clients. Um, that's not to say that money, sh money should be free flowing, but we, and the, and we might actually look at different ways of getting somebody into different spaces, like 
a climb uh, a stair climber or an all-terrain um, wheelchair instead of adaptations we can look at everything but we've still got to make that environment as much as possible welcoming for the individual so we need to go on to realistic and what they mean by realistic is offering more than one solution to help balance everyone's needs and recognizing that one solution may not work for everybody um, and i think we would probably say most of us do that in our own home anyway um, we put in things that fit us more than might fit say for example my husband or my family um, you put something in that meets your needs so to give you a great example is lighting we can use a conventional light switch as there is here um, but you could also use alexa you know alexa please put the lights on um, you could also use smartphones and technologies such as philips hue to be able to control your environment by your phone so it means it gives you options um, and choices for that individual to control their environment now and potentially in the future and I would always say let's be realistic here when we're designing that we might not need all this technology now but if we put in the hardware and we put in wiring and we put in facilities that enable us to modify our homes later or our clients homes later it's far more cost effective than trying to retrofit things uh, when there's a sudden change so it's this wonderful thing about OT is trying to have that crystal ball again um, and trying, saying, OK, we've got this wheelchair user. Um, they're going to be in this home for a long period. They're saying it's their forever house. We know there's going to be issues long term with um, joint pain and restrictive movements and difficulty um, doing things. So how are we going to make life easier for them in the future? Yes, they want to do everything now, but how are we going to do it in the future? So it's being realistic about how we design um, now to meet our clients' long-term needs. But it's also being realistic about what we can actually do. And there are times when we cannot adapt and we have to be completely honest with our clients. Um, I would say there's been very few that we can't adapt, even if for short-term need. Um, but we have to really look at it. And I, I want to talk about these two examples because they're really important. So the terrace house in Wales was a gentleman who had a stroke um, and wanted to return home to this property. This property meant so much to him. This was the home that he was born in. This was his parents' home. This is where him and his siblings grew up. This is where he had lived his whole life. And he couldn't see himself anywhere else. Um, he was a wheelchair user. Um, he could wheel very short distances on his own, but he had um, significant fatigue. He was in his um, late seventies and realistically he couldn't return because once you got into this property, there were steps everywhere and it was quite tiny and there was no way that we could really adapt it. Um, but we had to work with a psychologist to go through that grieving process with him. And we actually got him home to the front room. It was a front, it was they'd not the front and rear parlor and rear room together. Um, and we got him home just so he could realize that actually it wasn't the best choice for him. But he worked with a psychologist through the grieving process, through the sadness and the anger and the realization. And then we worked with him about what he wanted in a new property and where he wanted it so when we actually found a property and he was involved in every part of that finding of a property he realized this was a good decision for him going forward but then sometimes it's not actually the kind of uh, topography of a, a, a property that that's the problem it's sometimes that we are in a property like the other one which is a grade one listed building um, and this was a lady who was returning home from hospital as a wheelchair user. Um, now, a grade one listed property, you can't actually change the external or the internal fabric of the building. 
Um, we could, could put in temporary ramps. Um, they allowed us to do that, um, but they didn't want us going through last ceilings to put in lifts. Uh, they didn't even want us to change the windows and I have never seen such rattly windows in my life um, and because the lady had temperature control problems it was a real issue about maintaining um, her health and welfare um, and on top of that um, it was also on an English heritage site so not on, only did we have to work with the local authority uh, conservation officer we had to work with the English heritage um, heritage officer uh, and it became very clear that this was not going to be a long-term solution. Um, but the lady had to go home. But, and, and we had to give them choice and control on what they were doing. But we also had to go through that grieving and the loss of their home with both these clients. Uh, and again, inclusive design was not in place when these properties were built. And there's nothing we can do with them. And we have to accept sometimes realistically, we have to look at other options. So there is robust clinical evidence that our environment affects our physical and mental well-being. We know it, it's out there. Inclusive design principles can be used in designing homes for our clients and their extended networks. And we must never forget their extended networks. So, the reality in practice is if we do create an accessible home, it can enable occupational performance. It can enable um, reduced care costs. I'm not sure everybody wants to hear that, but it can if you provide a home that enables people to do things independently and with dignity. And the most important thing for me is if you have an accessible home where effort is not required, um, and it feels welcoming and it understands your needs, it can really have a massive impact on people's physical and mental health. And I just want to come back to my client. Um, the key to success is design is putting the client first. And with this client, we, we work really hard to find a property um, that was inclusively designed that was in the area that she wanted to be in. And we looked very much at the community because what was really important for this client was that she was able to um, get to a school uh, for her daughter, that that school was inclusive, that she was somewhere close to a train station that was wheelchair accessible, that enabled her to go back to work, even though at the time when I first met her, she wasn't at that point um, and, and with this client like lots of clients um, they have a settlement um, uh, they receive their funds and they often sack a therapist and I actually quite like that because I think they need time on their own I think they need time to just step back really reevaluate and work out what they, they want to do anyway about six months after the settlement this client asked me back because when I first met this lady actually in Stoke Mandeville um, when she just returned from um, Macedonia she she was lying in bed and I, I said to her so what what do you want to do with your life um, and she looked me straight in the eyes and she went I want to be able to ski with my daughter and I was like, OK, so you're here and skiing with your daughters here. Let's look at all those graded um, uh, things that we need to do to achieve that. So six months after the case had settled, um, she rang me up and said, can you come and see me? I just want to talk to you about a couple of things. And there was a couple of functional things. But she then said, can you try and direct me in the way of... Um, learn to ski as a wheelchair user. Um, so um, she went up to Milton Keynes and she learned to ski as a, a, a wheelchair user. Uh, and we kept in touch every now and then. Um, but approximately two years later, I received a text. And this was text from this client and it was a bit of a surprise. And it was a picture. And it was a picture of her in Verbier on her skis with her daughter. And she just put, got there. Now to me that was one of the most important and profound things of my professional key to date because what it meant was the inclusive design of her property 
was partly responsible for her skiing because she felt that she could achieve things. She felt that there was nothing that create, could create a barrier for her in her life. So inclusive design is key for occupational performance and it's key for goal success. So therefore, inclusive design is really important in reality and we can put it into practice. I've just put some references there for you if you want to do any further reading and just want to say thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I hope you have a fantastic conference. Take care. Bye-bye.